today we are going to look at anatomy of the vascular system. You remember we started on this series of lectures and uh, which is under the cardiovascular system. We have already talked about the anatomy of the heart. Well, we started by talking about the general anatomy of the mediastinum. Then we talked about anatomy of the heart. So today we are going to look at anatomy of the vascular system. We will also look at uh, how blood flows through the fetus, what we call fetal circulation. And we look at congenital anomalies of the heart. So today is a little heavy, but we will finish. Um, so let's just start straight away because we have a lot to cover. What you're going to learn in this first part will be, we're going to look at components of blood vessels, what really constitute blood vessels. We are going to describe the histological layers of vascular wall. We'll talk about histological types of arteries. I will mention the major arteries and veins in the body. And there's something I'll tell you to do. And then we will describe histological types of capillaries. So starting with the components of blood vessels from the heart, the blood vessels that leave the heart are called the arteries, you know that. They carry oxygenated blood to the systemic circulation, or if it is to the pulmonary circulation, then deoxygenated blood, but they're arteries. Arteries then divide into smaller vessels, which you call arterioles. Of important to note is that arterioles are the ones that actually regulate blood pressure. From arterioles, then we go to capillaries. The unique thing about capillaries is that they are the exchange units. The exchange between bloodstream and tissues occur at the level of the capillaries. Capillaries then unite to form venules, which are smaller veins. Then from the veins, blood go back to the heart. There are two large veins in the body, the superior vena cava that carries blood from the upper part of the body and the inferior vena cava that carries blood from the lower part of the body. They both enter into the right atrium. There are two parts of the circulation as I may have indirectly alluded to already. The exchange, the circulation between the heart and the lungs is what we call the pulmonary circulation. And that one is primarily for oxygenation of blood. So the oxygenated blood leaves the right chambers of the heart to go to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. And uh, then from the lungs, you have the pulmonary veins taking oxygenated blood back to the lungs, back to the heart. So that becomes the pulmonary circulation for oxygenation of blood. Then we have the systemic circulation. The systemic circulation is the one that then delivers oxygen to the various body organs, basically for delivery of oxygen in as much as may also deliver nutrients. How is the structure of a blood vessel wall. Each a blood vessel is considered to have three histological layers. And this is general, but some slight differences between arteries and veins. Let's just focus on the arteries. The innermost layer of a blood vessel is called the tunica intima. This tunica intima is lined by endothelial cells. The endothelial cells line the tunica intima. These endothelial cells form a barrier between blood and the tissues. Apart from forming a barrier between blood and the tissues, the endothelial cells are also important in other ways. For example, we can say that endothelial cells secrete vasoactive substances these are substances that can control the physiology of the blood vessel. 
either by causing vasodilation or vasoconstriction. Other than that, the endothelial cells are also important in the coagulation pathway because they participate in the initiation of the blood clotting mechanism. So remember the barrier function, remember the secretion of vasoactive substances and remember the fact that endothelial cells also participate in the activation of the clotting pathway. The second layer of blood vessel is tunica media. The tunica media tends to be the thickest layer of a blood vessel, especially for the arteries. For the veins, it could be a bit different, but for the arteries, the thickest layer. This tunica media usually contain two things. The, we have vascular smooth muscles, so they are interposed within the tunica media. And we also have the elastic fibers. The vascular smooth muscles are important because their contraction and relaxation affect the diameter of the vascular lumen. It is for that reason that then we say the tunica media regulate the luminal diameter of a blood vessel. Other than that, the elastic fibers are equally important because in their recoil properties, they're able to maintain a particular range of blood pressure. So to maintain a particular range of blood pressure through their uh, uh, stretching and coiling properties. The proportion of smooth muscles and elastic fibers within the tunica media form the basis of classification of arteries into different histological types and we'll be revisiting that shortly. The outermost layer of a blood vessel is called the tunica adventitia. Some people call it tunica externa. The tunica adventitia contain collagen fibers. The primary purpose of collagen here is to confer strength to the vascular wall so that uh, you maintain integrity so that you do not necessarily balloon the blood vessel, especially if the pressure here is too much, the blood vessel does not over distend, so prevents over distension. You learn later that abnormal ballooning of blood vessel is called aneurysm. So this layer actually prevents the aneurysm or dilatations of blood vessels. Okay, so those are the histological layers of a vascular wall. Now let's talk about the histological types of arteries as I alluded to slightly earlier. The histological types of arteries are based on the structure of the tunica media. Basically, we are looking at the proportions of elastic fibers as well as as well as the vascular smooth muscle. So on this note, there are three types of arteries. This is what we call the elastic artery. An elastic artery has several lamellae of elastic fibers within the tunica media. Several lamella, lamella means layers, several layers of elastic fibers within the tunica media. Actually, it has more elastic fibers, we can say, compared to even smooth muscles. Such arteries are called elastic arteries. And their primary role is basically in maintaining blood pressure in a particular range. Examples of such arteries include the aorta and the major branches, where the major branches here would include things like uh, the common carotid arteries and the initial segments of the subclavian arteries. We 
The second type of arteries is what we call the muscular artery. Muscular artery has most vascular smooth muscle within the tunica media. These muscular arteries are the most common type of arteries in the body. So things like femoral artery, brachial artery, all those are muscular arteries. The third histological type of arteries is not this one, arterial, not really, but what we call the hybrid arteries. You can call them musculoelastic arteries. So the hybrid arteries have a near equal proportion of elastic fibers and vascular smooth muscle within the tunica media. This hybrid arteries then is a mixture of the two characteristics of arteries. Examples of such arteries include the coronary arteries. Those are the arteries that supply the heart. So they are muscular elastic. Now, beyond the arteries, we have arterioles, which I told you are even smaller blood vessels just before you enter the capillaries. This is how the arterioles look like. Their wall is predominantly of smooth muscle. And that is why these ones determine a lot blood pressure through their vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So now I want to highlight to you the major arteries in the body. Now, this is where I tell you the truth that uh, it is not possible to learn all the arteries of the body in one sitting. It is not even possible in one day. So this is where your duty comes in. At your own time, you look at the atlas of the body again and again, and try to appreciate how the major arteries of the body run. For example, as you can see here, we have the aorta, which has a part going up. We called it last time the ascending aorta. Then it turns, we call that the arc of the aorta. Then it goes down, we call that the descending aorta. The descending aorta has a thoracic part and an abdominal part. The abdominal part is simply called the abdominal aorta. Then the abdominal aorta divides into two. We call them the common iliac arteries, which further divide into two internal and external iliac arteries. Now, I can't teach you all this in one sitting. It is up to you then to be looking at this atlas again and again, and you ask yourself which arteries goes where and how does blood reach to that artery. So for example, when you look at these images, you can see that the artery that goes to the upper limb is the subclavian artery. But where does it come from? It comes from the arc of the aorta on the left or brachiocephalic trunk on the right. Which arteries go to the heart? They are coronary arteries. Where do they come from? Coronary arteries come from the ascending aorta. So something like that, I, I want you to, I have just realized that these ones are not wrongly labeled in a way, so don't rely on these ones, but pick an atlas of um, the vascular system and look at the general arterial tree of the body. So mine is to ask you some questions that we commonly ask you. For example, we can ask you to name the main artery that supplies the kidney. Then you just say renal artery, the one that goes to the lung, pulmonary artery. It's just as straightforward as that. But maybe from a clinical point of view, we would want you to also know regions where we can pick pulsations of arteries. Soon after you're done with first year, you'll be going to the wards, hopefully. And uh, one of the things that you'll be required to know is the pulsation of some arteries in a patient. Either because you want to know the pulse rate so that you estimate the cardiac rate, 
or you want to confirm whether they're alive or dead or a procedure need to be done. And so you need to palpate the artery first before you do that procedure. So now we can have a discussion on that at this point in time. All right, let me just take that attendance first. Okay, good, now I'm done. So, um, I want to ask you these questions. If you want to fill pulsation of arteries, uh, there are some specific sites that I need to go to before I fill pulsation of an artery. For example, and you can even try on yourself, which pulsation of artery, which arterial pulse is felt at the wrist medially, the medial aspect of the wrist. That one I'll give to Adelida. Adelida, you in class? Good. Yeah, can you please repeat the question? So which 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 arterial pulse mm. is felt? on the medial aspect of the wrist. The ulna. Yes, so that's the ulna pulse. Yeah. Okay, Geraldine. Yes. Which arterial pulse would be felt behind the knee joint? The popliteal. Popliteal pulse, good. Johnny? Yes. Which arterial pulse will be felt in the inguinal region? The inguinal region is a groin. The external carotid. The groin. You know where the groin is? No. The groin is the junction between your thighs and your abdomen anteriorly. Between the? Your thighs and your abdomen. Is it the external iliac? No, we can't feel external iliac pulse we can feel the femoral pulse. So basically the upper part of the thigh is what you are calling the groin. So the artery there is a common femoral pulse. Joy, are you in? Yes. Okay, which arterial pulse can we feel in the middle aspect of the arm? Joy, carry on. The radio. Joy, do you know where the arm is? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Okay. So where is the arm, Joy? Between what and what? The arm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the arm is between each two joints, Joy? I'm not so sure. Okay, Kenya. Yes. Okay, Kenya. Which arterial pulse do we feel the middle aspect of the arm? It's the brachial pulse. The brachial pulse, good. Mariam. Yes. Which arterial pulse can we feel in front of your ankle joint? Um, the dorsalis pedis. Okay, that's still fair. Um, so it can be dorsalis pedis or anterior tibial artery. It can be anterior tibial pulse or the dorsalis pedis pulse. It depends on where you put your fingers on. 
but then dorsalis pedis pulse can also be felt on the dorsum of the foot. That's why it's called dorsalis pedis, dorsum of the foot. Marcy? Marcy, you're in, all right. Which arterial pulse can we feel behind your medial malleolus? Masi Kario. I don't know. Okay. Do you know where the medium malleolus is, Masi? No. Medium malleolus is that projection on the medial aspect of your ankle joint. That bony projection on the medial aspect of your ankle joint is what we call medial malleolus. Then the one on the lateral aspect of the ankle joint is called lateral malleolus. So now you know where it is. So are you able to try which other can be felt there on the medial, on behind your medial malleolus? Adios. Okay, Marcy, I think you didn't get what ankle is now. Fares? Okay. Yes. Fares, you've had the question I've asked Marcy. Can you answer it? Yes. Okay, carry on. Can you say the posterior tibial? The posterior tibial artery is the artery. That's the one we feel behind your ankle joint. Ross Marion. Yes. Which artery, which pulse? The can posterior be... tibial. Okay, Paris, we've had you. Paris, we've had you. Yes, you're right. Okay, the question to Rosmarion, which arterial pulse can we feel in your neck? Uh, carotid. Okay, so... The, the external carotid. Now we don't usually feel external carotid, we feel the common carotid pulse, common carotid pulse. Great, uh, the last okay. one. Uh, okay, maybe second last. These ones will be hard though, so let me just help you. So I hope you people can see my video. Uh, if you put your finger just in front of the tragus, the tragus is this thing here, um, that one, which is that thing in front of the ear, basically. If you put your finger there, between the tragus and that bone there, you feel an artery pulsating. And that's what we call the superficial temporal pulse. So superficial temporal pulse is felt in front of the ear. Then if you put your finger just below the body of your mandible posteriorly, you'll feel another arterial pulsation. And that is what we call the facial pulse. That's the pulsation of the facial artery. So we want you to know the pulsations of arteries. We want you to know where they are felt because it's of clinical importance. Great, so at your own time, be looking at the arteries again and again and have an idea which organ is supplied by which artery. The veins tend to follow arteries, especially the deep veins follow arteries and they basically share the same names apart from the very, very large veins where the aorta is accompanied by the vena cava. They don't, we don't have aorta vein. The same, we don't have vena cava artery. Perhaps the exceptions are the ones that accompany the common carotids. We don't have a common carotid vein. The veins that accompany the carotids are called the jugular vein. The others are almost relatively the same. Subclavian artery, so there's a subclavian vein. Femoral artery, so there's a femoral vein. Now that applies to the deep veins. Remember, we underscored this concept when we were looking at the anatomy of the lower limb and upper limb. The superficial veins will have different names, and that's why we mentioned at some point those things like the saphenous veins and the like. 
So what you'll do for the arteries, you'll also do for the veins. So you'll allow me to then proceed. Let's talk about structure of capillaries. Capillaries are different from arteries in that capillaries don't have those three layers that we have been singing about. Capillaries have a single layer of endothelial cells and their basement membrane. But there are three histological types of capillaries. This is what you call continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoidal capillaries. Let's look at each of them. When you talk of continuous capillaries, they look like this. The basement membrane demarcated by the red is intact throughout, is continuous. The endothelial cells are also attached to each other. We call this continuous capillaries. We find these capillaries in the nervous system, also in adipose tissue and in skeletal muscles. The second type of capillaries look like this. In as much as the basement membrane is intact, the red one, there are some two small holes through the endothelial cells. Those tiny holes through the endothelial cells make this capillary appear like a sieve. We call them fenestrated capillaries. These tiny holes are the fenestra. The term fenestra means window. So these are windows through which substances can pass through. Such capillaries are found in the glomerulus of the kidney, in the villi of the small intestines, and in endocrine glands. And you understand that in those three regions, there's a lot of absorption taking place. And that's why they need some small windows through which substances can pass through. Then we do have what we call the sinusoidal capillaries, others called discontinuous capillaries. Now this is the structure for the sinusoidal capillaries. The basement membrane is discontinuous, as you can see. It is interrupted. Also, the cells are not attached to each other. There are some gaps between the cells. These are the ones we're calling sinusoidal capillaries, and these ones are found in the liver, as well as also in lymphoid organs. All right, good. So that is the story as with regard to the vascular anatomy.